the Star Destroyer is a symbol of imperial might. The ISD is the spear tip that extended from the hand of the Emperor into the hearts of its enemies with the force of its symbolism and its many, many weapons. These ships carve their way through a star system faster than a knife through butter, or most things, knives are sharp. Coming in at 1.6 kilometers, that's the length of 7,874 sub-sandwiches, these floating fortresses would crush the enemies of the Empire and heralded the banner of order. Peace is a lie, there is only power. The Emperor knew this and lived by it, and his Star Destroyers were the extension of his power throughout the galaxy. The ISD ancestry started with the Acclimator-class assault ship, the Homo habilis of the ISD line. These ships were 752 meters long, and is first shown in Star Wars Attack of the Clones. These assault carriers could ferry about 16,000 clones to the surface of a planet and be used in space battles. As the tide of the Clone Wars continued to rise, the Republic needed a ship that was better equipped to turn the separate destroyed army back into toasters. These capital ships met the needs of the Republic Navy, Jedi Generals, and their little child murder servants, i.e. their Padawans. The Venator and the Acclimator were considered proto-star destroyers. There is little doubt that Palpatine not only used the Clone Wars to end the Jedi, but also to hone his military fleet into something with the strength and might to control the galaxy and unalive anything that crossed him. The Star Destroyer is manufactured in four primary locations, Kuat, Corellia, Bondor, and Ringovinda. This iconic ship represented three different designations, Imperial 1 class Star Destroyer, the Imperial 2 class Star Destroyer, and the Interdictor class Star Destroyer. At peak Imperial presence, the Navy operated over 25,000 of these chonkers. You can kill so many rebels with this bad boy. The standard crew of a ship would normally amount to over 9,000 officers and about 28,000 other personnel. Keep in mind that this is a fully human crew because the Empire was hella racist. Each ship was equipped with six heavy dual turbo lasers, two quad heavy turbo lasers, three triple medium turbo lasers, two heavy ion cannons, 60 turbo lasers and ion cannons, and 10 tractor beams. That's a lot of pew pew. One aspect of the ISD's versatility was the hangar bay. Not only could this ship deal out punishment and capital ship engagements, but could also launch a swarm of TIE fighters to entangle and eliminate the enemy. Each Star Destroyer could carry a full wing of TIE fighters, typically 72 TIE models, including fighters, bombers, and interceptors. This was usually enough to eliminate the enemy forces and replace all the fighters that got blasted out of the sky. For personnel movement, the ISD would come with 8 Lambda-class shuttles and 15 ITTs, or Imperial Troop Transports, to move its stormtroopers to and from the surface. This gave Imperial forces support in space, in atmosphere, and on the ground. Each ISD came with its own ground forces an entire legion of stormtroopers numbering 8 to 10,000, and over 100 assault vehicles. That's a lot of buckets. This included 20 AT-ATs, 30 ATSTs, and other vehicles including tanks, speeders, and other assault vehicles. These ships were effective in combat and sieges as well. The ship carried enough food stores for its crew for two years. Every ISD also contained barracks, training areas, meeting rooms, and cell blocks. If the Empire wished, it could strike at the forces in atmosphere and effectively blockade the forces below. This could be used to squeeze the local governments to crumble to the Empire's will. Imperial occupation was a real threat under the gaze of even one of these mighty ships. The standard Star Destroyer was the Imperial II class Star Destroyer. This was the workhorse of the Imperial fleet. However, even as imposing as these daggers were, without support ships, rebels could attempt surgical strikes to bring them down. One such support ship was the Interdictor class Star Destroyer or Heavy Cruiser, which was a common designation. This ship was much smaller in all its proportions compared to the Imperial II class. However, it could be put to great use. The main feature of the Interdictor was its four gravity well generators that were so large you could see the protrusions of these generators from the top and bottom sides of the ship's hull. These gravity well generators would function as a hyperspace net. Most hyperspace modules would disengage when confronted with a gravity well. This told the computer that the ship was too close to a planetary body to continue any farther without harm to the ship. These ships would be pulled from hyperspace only to be quickly met with Imperial forces. This was an ambush tactic that was lethal in its effectiveness. These ships could also be used to keep enemy ships from leaving the battle. In the Battle of Adalon, Thrawn's fleet engages rebels and is inflicting massive casualties. It is only when Constantine, commander of one of the Interdictor cruisers, disobeys Thrawn, getting him and his ship destroyed, thereby removing the gravity well, allowing the rebels to escape. Oftentimes, the might of the Empire was too much to be faced head-on for the Rebel Alliance. By forcing the rebels to prolong their engagements often led to great casualties and less tactical options. The ship that dominated rebels across the galaxy. The Star Destroyer exits from hyperspace and begins to acquire targets for its laser cannons and turbo lasers. 
as ships and system would begin to converge on the new threat, TIE fighters would begin to explode from the hangar bay. The ISD would target the closest frigate, bringing a full broadside of laser and ionic death onto its foe, smashing through its shields and targeting the engines. This target is torn apart and the ship is left lifeless out in the void. The turbo lasers have eviscerated the engines, and the ion cannons have disabled the rest of the ship. The ISD moves through the system, cutting down the enemy forces. The TIE fighters engage the local starfighters, overwhelming them with the weight of numbers and firepower. This would also provide cover for the bombers. The bombers are now cleared to target the enemy capital ship as it begins to navigate away from the engagement. TIE bombers fire concussion missiles at the aft portion of the ship. Most of the missiles detonate on the shields, dropping it down to zero. The bombers follow this with a full salvo of proton torpedoes. These detonate along the ship, slagging its engines and causing deep internal explosions that crack the reactor. For a brief moment, the ship becomes a sun as the reactor goes critical and then rends the ship into atoms. The rest of the fleet scatters. Those who are still alive attempt to jump to hyperspace. Little do they know, they are dealing with the Imperial 7th Fleet. An interdictor class star destroyer enters the system and powers up its gravity well generators. The rebel forces are denied their escape. Scrambling to get out of system, the Empire makes short work of these floundering rebel frigates. The rest either flee to ground or prepare for boarding as they have been caught in the tractor beams. There is no defense for this rebel world in space. The Empire is free to dominate the skies and bring the population into Imperial rule. Long live Emperor Palpatine. The Imperial Star Destroyer was feared across the galaxy. With its fleet subjugating the galaxy on a thousand different worlds, many became discontent, violent, and rebellious against the Empire. Palpatine could scatter his knives through the galaxy, but needed an executioner's blade to remove the head of the Resistance. This is when we see the Super Star Destroyer enter the scene. As a native of Texas, apparently, Palpatine followed the motto of Bigger is Better. The Super Star Destroyer was first seen in Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. We see Vader's flagship, the Executor. Rebel intelligence quoted the Empire with having close to a dozen of these ships in service around the time of the Battle of Endor. Confirmed ships in the Empire's possession were the Annihilator, Arbitrator, Ravager, Executor, which belonged to Vader, and the Eclipse, which belonged to Palpatine. These ships came in a variety of different designations. The Executor was the first to be seen on screen, so this is the ship we will focus on first. The Executor was 1,900 meters in length, equivalent to 12 ISDs end-to-end. -end. It was equipped with over 5,000 turbo lasers, 750 twin turbo lasers, 1,000 turret-mounted twin light turbo laser batteries, 100 twin battleship ion cannons, 125 concussion missile launchers, and 250 quad laser cannons. The Super Star Destroyer is the epitome of power and overcompensation. If the Super Star Destroyer was a truck, it would have a 6-inch lift kit, oversized tires, and the biggest pair of truck nuts this side of the Hydean Way. In the end, bigger is better. The bigger something is, the larger the explosion it makes when it gets stabbed in the eye by a solitary a -win. Thank you all for listening to this video. If you guys like this video, make sure to leave us a like and comment what other ships you guys would like us to cover in the future. These videos take time, effort, and funds, so to keep them coming, consider becoming a patron as well, where only $5 a month supports this kind of programming and comes with other perks as well. Thank you guys for watching, and may the Force be with you.